This is our third intention case. Here are two, we've looked at Jones and Locke, and then we've looked at Ree Adams and Kensington Vestry. As you know, equity acts in persona, takes every case on its merits, in other words, in terms of the individual activity or circumstances that have occurred. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we're going to look at next is a 1905 House of Lords, eventually House of Lords Authority, going by the name of Comiskey and Bowering Hanbury. So Comiskey and Bowering Hanbury. This is a, an interesting case, relatively similar in terms of the, the terms that were used in Re Adams, but with a slightly different outcome, as we'll see. What we'll focus on is that outcome, and bear in mind that maxim I've just used, but also perhaps some critique of that outcome. So the testator, who was the Right Honourable R. W. Hanbury, who was an MP, had significant assets which were made up in terms of the subject matter of this estate of a uh, some leasehold and freehold collieries, so substantial assets. I forget what we're talking about, 1905, uh, and a big money case, therefore an important battle for value. And who is the battle for value between, unlike Re Adams and Kensington Vestry, where we saw on the one hand we had the, the mother, Harriet, and then we had the daughters. Here we have, uh, this time, the wife and nieces, where Re Adams and Kensington Vestry we had that second self, here we see a similar kind of idea uh, operating, particularly in terms of the rationale of the will as to what might happen to the nieces, which is something that's important for us to consider. So, Hanbury's will, the testator, it said this, I give, this is to his wife, I give, bequeath and devise to my dear wife, Ellen Hanbury, the whole of my real and personal estate and property absolutely in full confidence that she will make such use of it as I should have made myself. And then it goes on that, that this, my will, shall at her death be equally divided amongst my surviving nieces. So this will shall at my death be equally divided amongst my surviving nieces. So the question for the court is, to what extent is there either an absolute gift to her, that's to say the wife, as we've just heard, we, uh, we saw that the, the, the use or deployment of the term absolutely was right next to in full confidence, unlike Henry Adams and Kensington Vestry. So absolutely in full confidence that she'll make such use of it as I should have made myself. So what does that mean? What was he trying to do? Either engraft some kind of absolute gift to her that had all, uh, additionally some kind of obligation, as we know, trusts or in essence obligations, to those nieces, or was it hers to do with entirely as she wished? Well, at first instance, it went before Mr Justice Kekowich, who decided on the construction of the will that it was given to the widow absolutely. So given to the widow absolutely. This was affirmed by the Court of Appeal, which included Vaughan Williams, of course, the relative of Rafe Vaughan Williams, uh, the judge or justice Roland Vaughan Williams, that is. Uh, so they affirmed Kekowich at first instance. The niece's appeal, again, and it goes up to the House of Lords, where, amongst others, we have... The Lord Holdsbury, who I think is just there, so you, uh, you might be able to see him in that picture. There's his picture and his signature there. <coughs> Excuse me, so Lord Holdsbury hears this appeal as uh, a member of the House of Lords also included, included McNaughton, Davy, James, Robertson and Lindley. And we'll focus on Lindley's dissenting judgment in, in a moment. Well... Holsby says this, he thought that the wife should have full use of the property during her lifetime and that at her death one of the nieces was to be the object of the bounty of the testator. That's to say then there was some kind of executory gift for the nieces as part of 
this construction. Remember, equity acts in persona, and these given facts are considered by these judges. Uh, 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 and on this ordinary construction, the words are deemed to create this interest for the nieces. <clears throat> Well, what's the rationale for the will? Well, we can go to Lord Davies' judgment for that, and then uh, Lord James, particularly Lord James, who who talks about the nieces being in different conditions and de deserving a different amount of beneficial gift at different times. So one niece could marry an earl, I suppose, a very rich earl, uh, in 1905 or 1906 after the case. But then another may you know, marry a poor equity lecturer like William Maitland or something. So... Uh, of course, they'd be in completely different positions in terms of how they might participate. Um, and it might be the case that the wife sees fit to give the, the wife of the lecturer more than the wife of the earl, who is now, of course, a countess. So, rich or poor niece activity, that is the rationale according to Lord James anyway. When, of course, the majority of the House of Lords hold that there is this executory gift, so a form of equitable obligation for the wife to think about. This, of course, isn't what all of the judges think, as I've said, Lord Linley dissents in a very short judgment, where he says, quote, I'm sorry to say I am unable to come to the same conclusion. It is impossible to say that a trust for the nieces, or at least for one of them, selected by the wife, cannot be extracted from this will. The wife was, in my opinion, intended to be the absolute owner, free from any legal or equitable obligation in favour of anybody, and free from any executory gift over. So there's a bit of critique, of course. Parker and Mellows, Anthony Oakley also critiques the case. Uh, and in particular, he focuses on the position of the word absolutely, as, as to how it sits next to in full confidence. Uh, and he thinks that perhaps the law laws, the majority, for example, Holsbury, didn't take sufficient account of absolutely. And if they had have done, of course, they would have been thinking that went more down the line of the Lord Davy. So Comiskey is important because it shows us how that maxim works, equity acts in personam. Also shows us how, don't forget, uh, this is a 1905 House of Lords judgment and we were just focusing on an 1884 judgment in re adams of the court of appeal so we've got the uh, two appellate courts going different ways that's also interesting um on relatively similar what we were calling in re adams anyway precatory language but here perhaps tending towards the imperative although of course it's an executory gift that we're talking about this this difference of obligation for the wife um so that's comiskey in a nutshell